So three things today. Love God, love neighbor, and then vocation. So the first one, to love God. So a scribe comes to Jesus, and as always, they were trying to trap him and get him to say something that they could say, aha, you're going against Moses, you know, who was after God. Moses was their everything. And they wanted to get him to say something wrong. And of course, Jesus, in his wisdom, he says this, quoting one of Moses' law from the first reading, Deuteronomy chapter 6. But Jesus says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Again, this is Deuteronomy 6. He adds something to what Moses had said in Deuteronomy 6. So Moses said to love him with your heart, soul, and strength. And then Jesus adds with your mind. But let's go back to this, this Shema that is what the prayer is called uh, for the Jews. So they would pray this every morning and every evening. And it's where we get our, our habit of praying morning and evening prayer in the liturgy of the hours. And they would have, you've heard in scripture them talk about phylacteries. They're like a little leather box. They would put these words of the Shema inside the box and then put it around their head as a sign of, we want to keep these important words from God through Moses close to our minds at all times. And so what do these words mean? The first word Shema, hear O Israel, means to listen, pay attention. And it says, O Israel, I don't know if you ever knew what the word Israel means, the name. So remember Jacob was renamed Israel, and Jacob had battled with the angel of God. And that's where he kind of, his hip socket was, was put out of place. And so the word, the name Israel means to struggle with God. And so I think it's interesting that, you know, God through Moses is saying, and Jesus is saying now, here, listen, you who struggle with God. I know this is not going to be easy. I know we all, you know, question our faith. We, we battle with God at different times in our lives. But pay attention. The Lord your God is Lord alone. There's one, one God. We've always talked about the, the uh, substitutes for God, right? Honor, power, pleasure, and wealth. We can make idols of many things. And those of you who are in Be Formed, you know, we're studying the Ten Commandments. And we've gone through the first four right now. You'll find that there's a lot more to these commandments than what meets the eye. But God is one, and we serve one God in three persons. He's the Lord alone. And then Moses says, love the Lord with your heart, which is where our will is, is grounded. Love the Lord with your soul, which is the animating part of our being. And love God with your strength. This is going to take effort. It takes participation. We need to apply ourselves. If, if you're an athlete, right, you have to put an effort in to get anything back in return. So yes, coming to church for an hour on Sunday is great. That's a, that's a great start. If you think about it, God has given us how many hours during the week? 168. One hour is less than 1% of your time. And so this is, this is the most important hour of our week. And what else are we doing to invest in this relationship with God? And remember, it's all about relationship. Again, if you're doing Be Formed, you'll hear this over and over again. The Ten Commandments are not just rules to take the fun out of life, but God is saying, I created you, and if you follow my ways, this is when you're going to be fulfilled. St. Irenaeus says, the glory of God is the human being fully alive. And we're most fully alive when we're living according to God's grace by following his commandments. And so Jesus added to these, to love the Lord with our heart, uh, soul, and strength. He says, love God with your mind. You can say, well, how do I love God with my mind? It's studying our faith. Our faith makes sense. And so that's why I'm such a strong supporter of adult faith formation, because the more you learn about your faith as an adult, all of these puzzle pieces start to come together and you realize, ah, that's the connection and our faith 
is strengthened, it makes sense. And so you're going to hear from me over the coming months about the characteristics of disciples. They give, they grow, they serve, they worship, they build community, and they live for Christ. And I think here he's talking about, you know, worship is an important part of being a disciple of Christ. And it's here in mass and adoration where we worship and we love God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And we also grow by studying our faith, getting to know, as Bishop uh, Hicks says, we need to know about Jesus and we need to fall in love with Jesus. And when our head and heart meet, that's when our faith comes alive. The second point is to love your neighbor as yourself. This is second because we can't love our neighbor if we don't love ourselves, And we can't love ourselves if we don't know that God loves us unconditionally. This is, I believe, one of the most important movements in the spiritual life is to know that at your baptism, God claimed you as his beloved son or daughter. And he says, you are mine and I love you. And that never changes that identity. Life will go like this, but that identity of being a beloved child of God will never change. And so remember, it always begins with God's grace. Everything begins with God, and he loved us first, and he wants us to know, not just here, but also here, the depth of his love for us. And once that happens, we start to realize, wow, if God loves me this much, maybe the people on either side of me, he loves them too. And we start to see people through a different lens. I know I, I have, I used to see people as, well, that they're them and they have their own lives and, you know, good luck, be, you know, be well fed and be on your way. But as I realize I'm a child of God, she's a child of God, he's a child of God, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ, and God wants us to love one another. He wants us to care for one another that goes beyond just the simple measures. So how do we love one another? Those characteristics of a disciple they give and they serve. And so some of the ways that we're doing that here at St. Isaac's, you know, we, we just we're gathering 500 coats for the poor people in Gallup. We're going to have a turkey collection for the little sisters of the poor. We have the seeds of service that collect thousands of bags of, uh, of food for the poor. We're doing the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, taking communion to the homebound, visiting the sick, going to the hospital, feeding the hungry. This is how we can put our faith into action. So the more we allow God to love us, the more we love ourselves, the more then we can love our neighbor. And so the third point is, it leads to our vocation. The more we know who we are in God, the more we can follow God's call in our life. So it's my pleasure, the third point tonight is not going to be by me, it's going to be by our seminarian, Daniel Obendorf. So help me welcome Daniel to uh, St. Isaac. Thank you, Father Burke. So uh, to get it out of the way, I am six foot nine, or eight and a half inches. I do play basketball. I also play volleyball too, so for those that like volleyball out there. Uh, good evening. As Father said, my name is Daniel Obendorf. I am a seminarian for the Diocese of Joliet, studying to be a priest. I am currently in my fifth of eight years of formation, um, and I'd like to thank Father Burke for allowing me to come and speak to you guys today. Um, Father Burke actually, when he was vocations director, accepted me to seminary uh, many, many years ago, so that was a great blessing for me back then. And so today I'm here to share with you two things. Uh, first, as Father talked about, why am I studying to be a priest? Why did I embrace this vocation to, to priesthood? And then secondly, just to ask for your support um, for myself and for my brother seminarians as we journey and study for priesthood. So first, why am I studying to be a priest? Well, when I was going into my freshman year of high school, I had this great plan for my life. I was going to get good grades. I was going to go to Notre Dame, just like my brothers. I was going to get a good job and then get married, which is, you know, not a bad plan. Those are good, holy things to desire. But the Lord had a different plan for my life that he was calling me to. And so he, he made this plan known to me through an unlikely source. It was, it was through my mother. Um, and my mom, she quite literally forced me to go on a retreat called the Steubenville Conference. 
And when I say forced, like, I mean forced. She packed my bag for me. She forgot my sleeping bag, which is a point of contention to this day still. And she dropped me off very early in the morning at a small church in Juliet. And I, I can't thank my mom enough for this experience because of how much it changed my life. And my mom is actually here at this Mass today, so thank you, Mom. And Dad, too, of course. So, so what happened at this retreat that, that changed my life so much? Well, at the retreat, it included Eucharistic adoration, which you guys are familiar with. There's an adoration chapel right behind me. Uh, so what happened is they took Jesus in the Eucharist, they placed him in the monstrance, and they put him on the altar. And I was sitting all the way in the back and all the way to the corner of this giant dark gym, so about as far away as you get from Jesus. And the priest did something that I'd never seen before. He walked up to the monstrance, and he picked it up and started to process it around the gym. And so the priest brought Jesus all the way back to me in the back of the gym. And then he took the monstrance and put it right in my face. And so I was looking up at Jesus, and he was looking down at me, and I opened my heart to the Lord just a little bit. Just a little bit. And in that moment, the Lord showed me how great his love for me is. It was a love that was totally unconditional, self-giving. It was, it was such a great love, it's more real than the ground is beneath my feet right now. It was a love that I, under, through that love, I understood there was nothing I could do that would make God love me more. And there was no sin I could ever commit that would make God love me less. He loved me totally and perfectly. And so shortly after this experience, the, the idea of priesthood fixed itself in my mind for the first time. Obviously, that was not a part of that plan that I had, and so it kind of came out of the blue. So what changed to help me to accept God's plan for my life? Well, I got to know some of the priests in my parish, and I realized two things. First, priests are normal people. <laughs> they don't just shut themselves up in the rectory all day and pray. They have hobbies, they play sports, they watch TV, they do things that normal people do. And then secondly, by getting to know these priests, I came to know what the joy of the priesthood really is. And I saw the life of a priest as inspiring and something to be desired. And so because of this, I took a visit to seminary and I really, really enjoyed it and said, this is where I want to be. And so I applied and as I said before, Father Burke accepted me. And so my time in seminary was just such a huge experience, such a huge blessing with so many, so many great experiences. Um, I got a chance to go to India and work um, in the footsteps of Mother Teresa with the poor. I get to play basketball against the parochial schools in the diocese, which is super fun. But it was also full of many challenges and many difficulties. Um, I even left seminary for two years recently, um, the last two years, to work as a youth minister in my home parish in Naperville. But through it all, through all the blessings, all the challenges, God walked with me. Whatever difficulty or challenge or blessing he led me to, he also led me through it. He was always with me. And so just as God was walking with me through my journey towards priesthood, I'd like to invite all of you to walk with me and my brother seminarians in our journeys towards priesthood as well. So this is the second thing I wanted to talk to you about. So uh, as I said, studying to be a priest is difficult. And so the first thing I'd ask you to do is, is just to pray. Pray for our priests, pray for our seminarians, but especially pray for the young men that are thinking about going to seminary and the young women that are thinking about joining religious life. There's a lot of reasons why, why young people say no to these vocations from fear and anxiety to family pressures to financial issues. And so I'd ask you to pray for them to have the courage to embrace the plan the Lord has for their lives. Secondly, I'd ask you to I forgot something. This is my first time, so I'm a little out of order right now. We have these nifty little prayer calendars to help you to remember to pray for us. And so there'll be an usher out back with them, and so you can stick it on the fridge and remember to pray for us um, during the week. And so uh, that is super helpful just to have you guys just praying for us and supporting us through that way. We, we need the grace of God, as Father talked about, as we, we work with God, as we wrestle with God through our discernment of our vocations. And so the second thing I'd like to ask of your support for is many years back, the diocese started an endowment fund to help pay for um, the formation of priests in the diocese. So we have this really good problem of we have a lot of men studying to be priests right now, but unfortunately, it costs a lot to form a man to be a priest. And it happens over the course of eight years, which is a really, really long time. And so they made this endowment fund in order to help make 
make uh, the formation of priests less of a financial burden upon the diocese. And so I'd ask you to prayerfully consider making a donation to this endowment fund so that we can continue to form priests now and in the future for all young men that decide to join the seminary as well. And so next week during the second collection, Father will take up a second collection for the endowment fund, and so we'll continue to, to grow it so that we can continue to form priests for the future. Thank you for all those in advance uh, who generously donate to that. That is, is very helpful to, to us and to all those that will come after us. So to recap, two things um, I'm asking you to do. Please pray for us. Nifty prayer calendars in the back. And secondly, please prayerfully consider making a donation to the endowment fund. So I'll be in the back of church after Mass. One of the ushers will be handing out the prayer calendars. I would love to meet all of you and hear some of your stories. Um, so please come back, back and, and say hello and, uh, and greet me. And uh, thank you so much for all the prayers you have already said for us and all the prayers you're going to say for us. And thank you for all the support that you give us as we are being formed to be priests. God bless.